How are we doing, Grid family? Amen. There we go. Grab your Bible. Open to the book of Acts, chapter number two. Now, let me just in full disclosure tell you kind of where we're at today. Acts chapter number two, verses one through twelve. When we finished our uh, collection of talks in the first, second, and third John, we had a, a like a gap in weeks where I could preach about really whatever I wanted to preach about, and. I came, I felt like the Lord dropped the word on my heart for Acts chapter 2 back in October. And so I preached this message you're about to hear right now. I preached this four months ago. And if you were in the crowd on that day, you're going to be doubly blessed. You're going to be rewarded with another dose of the Holy Ghost today in your life. Because we're going to bring the same word that I brought a couple months ago. But I felt like this. In full disclosure, I was fully prepared to kind of skip over this passage and move on to the next one. But I felt like if we did that, we're going to miss out on the rest of what God has to say in the book of Acts. So we're going to jump in. I'm going to preach this message again because I believe if you weren't here, there's going to be a power that's poured out upon you today. There's going to be a power poured out upon your family today. There's going to be a power available for you today that we're going to read about in this story. So it doesn't matter that my sermon's the same. The word of God never changes. The word of God never returns void. I can read the same thing every week and it can have the power to change lives. Amen. So we're going to jump in here. Let's jump in. Acts chapter number two. Um, let me also, just by way of introduction, um, say this. Today we are talking about what is known as the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Okay, now I don't know your background. I don't know how you were raised. I don't know what kind of church you grew up in. I know we have a large percentage of our church here and online that came from the Catholic Church. I know we have many come from a Presbyterian background. I know we have many come from a more liturgical background. I know we got tons of different backgrounds. I myself came from a, a, um, a spirit-filled background. It'd be more of a, like evangelical, Pentecostal type background. That's the background I came from. So I don't know what you've been taught. I don't know what you've been told. I don't know what your experience is when I say the baptism in the Holy. I don't know what your experience is when I say speaking in tongues. When we sing that song, Tongues of Fire, right? When we sing that, I don't know what images come to your mind. I know what images come to my mind. Because when I grew up in church, like we, we kind of grew up in, in I'm not going to name names, although I could, and probably many who came from the same background probably know the names I'm thinking of right now. But there are some, like I came from the background where we have people, right, like in our church, there'd be like massive crowds of people and the preacher would get up on the platform and they would just like go over to a section and they would just like wave their hand and people would like fall and people would like fall out and just be like we had people come back like falling out. We had modesty cloths in case you were wearing a skirt. We had to make sure everything was covered there. We had the whole thing. Like, this is the background I came from. So I came from a background that highly abused the baptism and all. It was a very emotional. It was very um, just crazy. Like, I, I like I, I was scarred. I felt like, uh, like coming out of it. I was like, oh, this, is, this is crazy. But as I, as I got back into the Word of God, I had to come to terms with the fact that this is in the Word of God. Maybe not the whole extreme that I grew up with, but the Word of God does not return void. The Word of God is very clear when it comes to the baptism in the Holy Spirit. So although, I don't, again, I don't know what images flood your mind. I don't know if you're like, you're, you're like maybe, you know, those, those people were like, um, they were like babblers, right? Like they're the babbler people. They're like the name it and then you grab it and then you blab it and then it's yours, right? Like you, I don't know what it would just come to your mind, but I want to be faithful to the word of God today. So Amen. let's jump in. Um, let me just kind of show you this as we come to Acts chapter two. Acts chapter two, we have, as we've been in our collection, we've got a group of 120 people waiting on the promise of the Holy Spirit, waiting on the promise of the Father. Remember Jesus He's resurrected, he, he, like he's risen from the grave, and then he appears to the disciples, he appears to a group of people, and he gives them this command. I want to show you Matthew chapter 28. Jesus gives a number of commands. He says this to his disciples after his resurrection. Therefore, go. Everybody say go. 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 Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Now, this is what we call the Great Commission. This is the Great Commission of the church. It's still in effect today. This is your command. This is my command. Go and make disciples of all nations. All right. And then he says this in Acts chapter 1. We already read this in our collection. He says this. Once when he was eating with them, he commanded them. This is Jesus talking to the disciples. He says, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father 
Um, so, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized you with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So this is really interesting, right? Like, he, first of all, Jesus says, go, go and make disciples. But then just a few days later, before you're to go, he says, don't, he says, wait, do not leave to your go. But before you go, you got to wait. Before you go, you got to wait and you got to not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift, wait for the promise of the father, which tells us something powerful here that in their waiting, they're going to receive something that empowers their going. That in order for you and I to have the power to tell people about Jesus, we got to wait on the gift of the Father. we got to wait on the power that the Father promised the early church and that he promised you. So in their waiting, in their not leaving Jerusalem, in their waiting for the promise, they're going to receive something that empowers their going. So for the next 10 days, the disciples, and we read the list in Acts chapter 1, the disciples and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and a group of women, and a group of close followers, with Jesus. they all get together in an upper room, kind of like in a room we're sitting in today. They all get together. They're all anticipating this gift. They're all anticipating the promise of the Father. They're all waiting for the gift of the Father, and they're waiting, and they're waiting, and they're waiting, and they're waiting. They're waiting for the promise of the Father. I say this today because what we are talking about is what is known as, in theological terms, it's known as the baptism in the Holy Spirit. The baptism in the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to be, um, let, me, let me just back up here. My, my goal today is not to convince you of a theological um, truth or even a debate. That's not my goal here today. My goal is to be faithful to Scripture and what we read and what God, and what God did in the early New Testament church. And my goal is also this, to encourage you to seek the promise of the Father, to seek the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, to be clear, my goal today is not to encourage you to seek tongues. That's not my goal. Now, we're going to come to find out this is part of the experience, but it is not the end of the experience, nor is it the thing that you should seek in the experience. It's just simply part of it, okay? Now, what trips a lot of people up what trips a lot. Maybe you're here today and you're like, I got tons of questions. I got tons of background when it comes to speaking in tongues and people that did that and people that do that. I got tons of questions. What trips a lot of people up is that we simply don't understand the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We don't understand it. Well, listen, you are a great company today because the disciples, they didn't understand it either. Jesus said, wait. They didn't know what they're waiting for. They didn't know what it would be like. They didn't know what it would sound like. They had no idea what was coming their way when they were waiting on the promise of the Holy Spirit. But you've heard about it. You've heard people maybe speak in tongues. Maybe you've heard this whole thing. You've got these images in your mind, but you don't understand it. The fact of the matter is, can I tell you that Jesus wants every believer to experience the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Let me show you next chapter 1, verse number 8. Jesus says this, but you will receive power. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Power. That word power quite literally means explosive power. It means uh, uh, dynamite type. But you will receive dynamite, dunamis, uh, explosive type power. And you'll be my witnesses in all of in the word witnesses. This is. This is amazing. We've talked about this word witnesses before. Witnesses is synonymous with the word martyr. It's synonymous with the word you'll be willing to lay down your life for the cause of Christ. You'll be willing to lay down your life and lay down your reputation for the sake of people coming to know Jesus. And this is his promise. But you will receive this power. You will receive this dynamite, explosive power. And you'll be my martyrs. And you'll be my witnesses. And it begs the question, what would make you, what would make me say, I'm okay with laying down my life for the cause of Christ, what would be, what would cause someone to say, I'm okay with the fact that I may lose my life, I may lose my family, I may lose my reputation, I may lose everything in my life, but if people come to know Jesus, it's all worth it. What would cause someone to be so crazy enough to say, that's okay with me? It's power. It's the power that Jesus promises you, and that he promises the early New Testament church, and that he promises us today. I don't know what you've been taught about the Christian life. But it is so much more than getting saved and then waiting around for Jesus to come back. 
or waiting around to die. It's so much more than that. It's designed to be lived in relationship. And more than that, it is designed for you to go and to make disciples of all nations. This is your job. This is your mandate. This is my mandate as a believer in the Lord. You go and make disciples. It doesn't say, hey, pastors, go and make disciples and go and plant churches and go and send missionaries. No, no, no. It says, therefore, you go. Everyone go. If you're a believer here today, your job, your mandate is to go and to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son. Why do we pray for the sick? Because in heaven, there's nobody sick. Why do we go to the streets of our city and we feed the hungry? Because in heaven, there's nobody hungry. Why do we do these things? The call for every believer is through prayer to call down the realities of heaven to earth. And we do this through the power that Jesus promises us, promises us in Acts chapter uh, 2. Now, let, let me just give one more disclaimer, and then we're going to jump in here to Scripture. It's going to be good and juicy today. Even if you don't understand the baptism of the Holy Spirit, even if perhaps you, you disagree with the baptism in the Holy Spirit, even if you're like, you know what, I come from a background and, and it was taught negatively or it was taught in a way that made me think, nah, I don't want anything to do with that. Even if you don't understand it, my challenge for you today is this. As a believer, every believer should at least the very basic level of Christianity say, God, I am open to whatever it is you want to do in my life. And if that means, even if I don't understand or don't agree, you baptize me in the Holy Spirit, then Lord, so be it. Amen? This is our prayer here today. So with all of that, let's jump into Acts chapter number 2, and we'll start reading here in verse number 1. Uh, Luke says this, When the day of Pentecost came, they're all together in one place. So remember, we got the group of people. They're all in the upper room waiting together. When the day of Pentecost came, what is Pentecost? Pentecost is, I think, in understanding the background, it'll help us to understand the significance of why it's important for us today. Pentecost refers to uh, a feast of harvest. Okay, In that time, Jerusalem, this was 50 days after the Passover. Now we come to Pentecost. 50 days after Passover is Pentecost. Pentecost would be known as the feast of of harvest, right? So the thing that you planted months ago, the thing that is taking root months ago, now you're coming to harvest. We can think about it like in terms of Illinois. We got tons of cornfields, we got tons of bean fields here in Illinois. When you plant that seed, what happens? Eventually it's gonna grow into a corn stock, it's gonna grow into a bean stock. Is that what it is? A bean? I don't know. Stock? Sure, sure. Bean stock. We'll call it a bean stock or a corn. Whatever it is, it's going to grow. That's what's going to happen. And you're going to harvest that corn. You're going to harvest that fruit. You're going to harvest that. And it's so interesting that on the feast, on the day of Pentecost, on the feast of harvest, there's going to be an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And one guy is going to stand up and deliver a sermon. And 3,000 souls are going to be harvested into the kingdom of God. On the day of Pentecost, so fitting, so appropriate, so powerful that the Spirit would be poured out on that day and 3,000 people come to know Jesus and the church is now born and the church now begins and the commission of going and making disciples is now a reality for the early New Testament church and for us today on the day of Pentecost, on the day of harvest, uh, there's going to be a harvest of souls. This is my heart. This is my prayer. This should be our prayer as the church of Jesus Christ. That every day we're looking for harvest. Every day we're looking for the people we work with who don't know Jesus to be harvested into the kingdom of God. To be adopted into the kingdom of God. That our bosses, that our co-workers, that our families, that people that don't know Jesus. Come to know Jesus on the day of harvest. Amen. On the day of Pentecost. This is the day that will forever change the world. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Verse number two. And suddenly... A sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. You say, what, what was the sound? What, what, what was that like? Why? I don't know. I don't know exactly. But you can think about it in terms of, it literally translated, it means like a tornadic type wind. Have you ever talked to somebody who has lived through a tornado? I, I grew up in Tornado Alley. I grew up in Dallas, Texas. So tornadoes were very common where I grew up. And we lived through tornadoes, and we, we would all describe, if you've ever talked to anybody who's lived through a tornado, they all describe it as like the sound of a freight train, right? Like it's a sound, this massive, ridiculous wind freight train thing coming your way. So there's this sound. 
there's this violent rushing wind. This is unique because this isn't the first time in the Bible that we read about uh, sound or wind being associated. Remember in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, they, they're walking with Jesus. The Bible says in the cool of the day, they can hear God walking in the garden. When, when Ezekiel calls down the cherubim, he describes it as like a mighty rushing Niagara fall. This isn't, this, this isn't the, like new to us. This isn't new to like the early New Testament church. Every time God shows up, there is a sound. What I want us to notice is not only are they hearing the sound, but there are other people hearing this sound. There's a violent sound. There's a crit. They're all in one room. Like imagine we're all here together today. There's a violent sound. There's a violent rushing wind. And people on the street are like, what is happening on the sixth floor? Of, this is what would be happening in the early, this, this particular, there's a violent wind. And not only do they hear it, but everybody in Jerusalem starts to hear it. Verse number six, look at it. When they heard, when this crowd heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment. So powerful, so unique, that when God does a work, other people notice when God does a work in your life, other people begin to take notice. When God does a work in your family, other people begin to take notice of it. This is remarkable that when God does a work in a body of Christ, when God does a work in our church, other people begin to notice it. It's not just happening for us here. It's happening so that other people begin to take a notice of that. Suddenly it sounded like a blowing of the violent wind came from heaven and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Verse number three, they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on them. Each of them. Some scholars say that this this um, tongues of fire was like a shaft, like a like a literal shaft of fire that came from heaven and separated on each and every one of them. I can I can I can only imagine. Can I tell you this that what we're praying for is revival. Mm -hmm. What we're praying for in our church. My prayer has been all year long is God may revival break out in our church and may it spread across the city and may it spread across the globe. This is my prayer. This is our prayer. That, that the tide is rising. That there is a move of God happening. We don't have to look for things that God is doing. We simply have to pick from the things that God, there is a tide rising in our church. There is a tide rising in this city. There is a tide, there is a move of God happening. There is a move of God coming. There's a move of God happening and a move of God coming. There's a constant tide rising here. We're praying for this. We're praying for revival to come. Everything we see starts small and then gets big. This is what God does. The early New Testament church started with 120 people and it grew in just six short months to over 100,000 people. This is what happens when the move of God happens. I believe God has brought us to this point so that every person who hears this talk today would have a sense of urgency that God has called you. God has a divine plan for you. God has a remarkable plan for you, and he wants to pour out his power upon you individually today that you go and you make a difference in your world. Amen. I want to read an account. I read this last time, and I want to read it again because this isn't the first account that we read about uh, or I'm sorry, this isn't the only account that we read about where fire showed up on the scene. Uh, if you are familiar with the Azusa Street Revival in the early 1900s, this is where kind of our church was birthed, that we are very much part of that movement. The spirit-filled, evangelical, Pentecostal movement, we're very much part, we were birthed out of this revival. Let me read this account to you because it is very powerful that when the spirit of God comes and it comes in the form of fire, this isn't the only time we read about it. Um, the Azusa Street Revival was a historical revival meeting that took place in Los Angeles, California. It was led by a guy named William J. Seymour. He was an African-American preacher. And I mention this, and I mention his race, because this was happening in a time that was greatly racially divided in our country, which shows us something powerful, that when, the move, when a move of God happens, it does, not, it does not discriminate at all. It is for every person, every man, woman, boy, girl, color, you name it. It is for every single person. The revival began on April 9, 1906 and continued until roughly 1915. On the night of April 9, 1906, William Seymour and seven men were waiting on God on Bonnie Bray Street when suddenly, as though hit by a bolt of lightning, they were knocked from their chairs to the floor. And the other seven men began to speak in a heavenly language and shout out loud, praising God. The news quickly spread and the city was stirred. This is Los, this is LA. I mean, this is Los Angeles County. The city was stirred. 
Crowds gathered. And a few days later, Seymour himself received the Holy Spirit. Services were moved outside to accommodate the crowds who came from all around. People fell down under the power of God as they approached. And people were baptized in the Holy Spirit, and the sick were healed, and sinners received salvation. The testimony of those who attended Azusa Street Revival said, I am saved, I am sanctified, I am filled with the Holy Ghost. They finally had to move the revival to a building. One night there appeared to be on top of the building a fire. A fire on top. So the people gather around and they see what seems to be a fire on top of this uh, roof. Local citizens called the fire department. And when they arrived to put the fire out, they could not, as the fire was supernatural. It wasn't natural. Listen, I can't forecast what God will do. I can't forecast what God is going to do. But I say this, I'm open to whatever God wants to do. I, I, I'm at a place, I've gotten to a place over the last two years during this pandemic where I am tired of seeing people beaten down, tired and out, destroyed by whatever. It is. I'm tired of that. I'm tired of living in this place. And my prayer has been, God, I am so hungry for a move of you that I'm tired of coming together with plans and set lists and organizing. I, 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 God, I want simply what you have for us. I want to move of God to happen so much that there appears to be tongues of fire separating yes. and falling upon this venue. I want people on the street to say, what is happening? Why? But call the fire department because there appears to be a fire. And when they arrive to put it out, they recognize this is not a natural fire. This is supernatural. This is what's happening. This is what's coming in our church. I'm prophetically declaring that there is a revival happening. There's a revival coming. And it comes when people are hungry and it comes when people are thirsty and it comes when people say God you promised us God you made us a promise that you give us this power so God do it and do it again and do it again and do it again and then do it again and don't stop doing it this is what happens there's a powerful remarkable revival happening coming happening in our church yes. that will revolutionize the face of this city yes. I don't say this as pastoral fluff talk I say it because this is the heart of God. God is not willing that anyone should perish. God is patient, waiting. God is patiently waiting for everyone to come to know him. And how do people come to know him? Therefore, go and make disciples. Therefore, you go and you make disciples of all nations. Yes, God, thank you, Jesus. I simply want whatever God has for us in the church. Verse number four. The Bible says, and all of them were filled. All. All. All of them were filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And Peter's going to go on. We're going to read this here in a few weeks. Peter's going to go on and say this gift is for everybody. Mm. This gift does not discriminate against whether you're what, what gender, your religion, your, 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 your ethnic background. It doesn't discriminate against your background that you came out of. It doesn't. It, this is for everybody. Everybody. Some today, maybe you're having a hard time understanding this. Maybe you're having a hard time coming to terms with what the Bible says here. It's simply because you've heard sermons about this. And although they're well-meaning, they're simply wrong. Because the Bible, nowhere in the Bible does it say, you can read. And I'd encourage you to do this. Nowhere from this moment forward does the Bible say that this was only for the New Testament church. It doesn't say that. This power, this, uh, this power, this promise is available for you today to operate in this power today. And again, I want to be clear that the Bible does not encourage you to seek speaking in tongues. It encourages you to seek the power of the Holy yes. Spirit. As part of the power coming upon you, you will be inundated with a heavenly language. That is part of it. But it is not the end of the experience, nor is it the thing you should seek in the experience. It's just simply part of it. I believe a tool that the enemy uses all the time is to get people talking about it and fighting about it and debating about it and denominations debating about it rather than seeking the power. I mean, imagine if we stopped debating about it. Imagine if we stopped fighting about it about it and we simply said God 
Whatever you want to do. God, I want to read. This is what I read in the scripture. And whatever you want to do. If you want to baptize me and I start speaking in a language I don't know. Awesome. I don't care. I just want what you have for me. Imagine if we all put aside our backgrounds. And we were so faithful to the word of God. We said, God, whatever your word says, that's what I want. Whatever your power dictates, that's what I want. Whatever your promise dictates, that's what I want in my life. God, whatever you want to do. This is what I want. Look at all of them. All of all of them were filled. We got we got we got new believers in the room. We got old believers in the room. We got Jesus' mother in the room. We got the disciples in there. All of them were filled. All of them were filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't say preachers were filled. There wasn't a preacher in the room. It doesn't say that it, it's just it's just for a church. No, no, no. It says all of them. All of them were all of them were filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Are you tired? Yes. Are you tired of seeing your your family die and go to hell? Are you tired of seeing your friend, your neighbors, the people you go to, you, the people you, you do life? Are you tired of seeing them die and go to hell? I'm tired. I'm tired of it. And the good news is, is that you have the answer. You have the, the power is available for you today. The answer is revival. The answer is the Holy Spirit coming upon you. It says all of them were filled. That word, let me just take a moment. That word filled. All of them were filled. Imagine in the literal translation, it literally means like if you think of a, a sailboat and, and wind feel, filling the sail. Uh, the idea is that the, the wind so fills the sail that it's almost like you don't have control of the boat. It's almost like, you, you, like you're, you're just allowing the wind to take you wherever direction you want to go. And you look back and you recognize, I didn't make one single turn in the boat. Like the, the wind did it all. This is that word. This is the, and, the, and all of them were filled. All of them had the wind and the spirit of God so filling their sail that they were now led by the power of the Holy Spirit to go in to cast out demons, to go in to share people, to go in to, uh, to raise, the, to go in to do miraculous signs and wonders that we read about. And all of them were so filled. All of them were their, their sails were so filled with the wind of God, with the power of God, that they weren't making the decision. They were simply following the lead of the Holy Spirit. And they looked back and they reckoned, I didn't make one single decision. The Spirit led me. This is what that word means. All of them were filled. Is your life so filled with the Spirit of God? It's almost like you're not making the decisions on where you go. You were simply following the lead of the Holy Spirit. And you look back and you recognize, I didn't get myself here. The power of God did. The power of God got me to this got me to this place. All of them were filled with the power of the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Let me just make it clear one more time. Speaking in a prayer language is not the end of your experience. I think oftentimes people get there and then they stop. And they're like, well, I got tongues. I got a heavenly language, so like I'm I got the power now. No, no, no. The ultimate biblical evidence in your life is not tongues, it's power. Power to go, power to do, power. This is it. Verse number five. Now there were staying in Jerusalem, God fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. Verse number six. When this crowd heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in their own native language. I, I could honestly give you. Um, Example after example of what we just read. All of them heard, like, uh, let me give you an example. I'll give you an example. I shared this example last time, and I think it's powerful. We had a lady come to our church. She was visiting from Belgium. At the time. This is pre-pandemic. She was visiting from Belgium. And she walked in, and she spoke, uh, she, you know, she did speak English, but that wasn't her native language. She came into our service. She was worshiping with us. And she heard in our, in our church, I think she was sitting next. I don't remember who she was sitting next to because I would have loved to have a conversation with that person afterward. But she describes the experience as, man, I, I, like I, couldn't, I couldn't describe it. Like I felt so, she described it as warm and, and like fuzzy and I felt so good in the presence of God is what she was saying. And she said, you know, what was so unique to me was I didn't recognize that this was a, like a bilingual church. I'm like, well, you know, I mean, we're primarily an English speaking church. Um, and she said, no, 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 there was a, I was sitting next to a lady who was declaring the wonders of God and she was declaring the wonders of God in my own. I could understand what she was saying in my dialect. I could understand what she was saying. 
And I, and I went on to explain to her, listen, this is what happens when the power of God comes upon somebody. They may begin speaking in a heavenly language, in a language that they don't know, that they can't interpret, but someone else may know. Someone else may be able to interpret. This lady comes in and says, I recognize that language, that dialect, and they were declaring the wonders of God. And afterward, I asked them, listen, do you speak this dialect? And they said, no, I don't. I said, I was just simply praising God. We were able to tell this woman, this lady, what the what, like what this was. She gave her life to Jesus in that moment. This is the power of what God yes. does. This 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 idea of speaking in a heavenly language. Listen, can I just tell you this? To to not to discount to, to discount the creative nature of God is to gravely discount. God is willing to do anything He can to reach people, even if that means He causes you to speak in another language that you don't understand, so that someone else may hear the wonders of God being declared, that they may come to know Jesus. Don't discount the creative nature of our God, who is unwilling yes. for anyone to perish. Yes. They were all. They, they heard their their language in their own native. They heard this in their own native language. Verse seven. Utterly amazed, they asked. This crowd asked, "Aren't these all uh, who are speaking Galileans translated? Aren't these all uneducated morons?" This is what it literally translates as. Aren't these all uneducated idiots? Verse eight. Then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? Verse 11 says this. What, what were they saying? We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. What languages were they speaking? Verse 9. Parthians and the Medes and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, from both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? What does this mean? This, what we just read, is the launching of world evangelism. This is the launching of world missions. At the cross, Jesus began to, un no, Jesus undid what Satan had done. Jesus undid what Adam and Eve had done, what we just read about. Remember after the great flood? After the great flood, then God comes down and he looks at the people and he says, now go into all the world and populate the world after the great flood. And the people look around and they say, no, no, no. I, you know, I, that's cool, God. That's a good plan. But we're safe together. We're good here together. So we're going to stay here. And we're going to build a, like a giant ziggurat up to heaven. We're going to build this giant tower up to heaven. And God says, wow, you are so unified. That's amazing. And in my mercy, I'm now going to zap you with different languages and different people groups. And I'm going to spread you throughout the entire earth. And this is now known as the Tower of Babel. And God, in that moment, in his mercy, began to undo the Tower of Babel. In this moment, God brings together every nation. God brings together every tribe. God brings together every people group under the power of the Holy Spirit. And he undid what he did in Babel. And he brought everybody into the kingdom of God, into the power of God. So the when we come to Revelation chapter 7, we read this. After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude. Jesus. From every nation and tribe and people and language. Standing before the throne, before the Lamb. Thank you, Jesus. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And what makes all of this possible? It's the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It's a group of people who say, God, I'm tired of seeing my family dead and dying and going to an eternity away from me. I'm tired of seeing my co-workers dead and dying and going to spend an eternity. I'm tired of seeing people burn in hell. For I'm tired of this. And it causes the people to say, God, would you so fill me with the power of the Holy Spirit? That this reality become true here on earth. That the realities of heaven become true here on earth. That every tongue and every nation and every tribe and every people group come before the Lamb of God. The cry of salvation belongs to our God. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit. 
And it's so amazing to think about as we go back to Acts 1 verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Remember verse 12, the people asked, what in the world does this mean? We heard all of these different things. What does this actually mean? And guess who's going to answer them? It's Peter. It's the guy who just 50 days earlier denied the fact that he ever knew Jesus. It's the guy who 50 days earlier said, no, nope, that's not me. No, nope, you got the wrong guy to a little girl. He says, no, nope, little girl, that you are mistaken. Three times he denied the fact that he ever knew Jesus. And in 50 short, no, 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 uh, let me take that back. In one single moment, Peter's life was changed. And he's now inundated with the power of the Holy Spirit. The guy who denied Christ three times on three different occasions, denied Christ. Now in one single moment, baptized in the power of the Holy Spirit, stands up with authority and declares to a group of thousands of people that Jesus, Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is Lord of all and 3,000 people on day one of the church come to know Jesus. In one single moment, Peter's life is forever changed. Can I ask you today, are you filled with the power of the Holy Spirit? Not have you, not in the, not have you, not in the halfway full, no, no, no. Are you so full of the Spirit of God? And you say, Pastor, how do I know? How do I know if I'm full of the power of the Holy Spirit? Here's how you know. You are willing to share Jesus with anyone, anywhere, anytime. Anyone, anywhere, anytime. And signs and wonders aren't just things that you believe in, but they are things that you actually participate in through the power of God working through you. This is how you know you are full. This is, and some of you, listen, you, like, you, you start, you got, you were, you were getting there, right? Like, you, maybe you, you, you were, you were, God, give me the power. God, and maybe you, you got up heavenly, maybe you started praying in a heavenly language, and you're like, this is amazing, this is so incredible, and then you stopped, and you stopped right there. I don't say this to be unkind to you. I simply say this to say there is more for you. There is more for you. There is more power available for you. There is more for each and every one of us in this place. We need this power. I need this power. I constantly need this power, God. I want to constantly remind God, God, you made me this promise. God, you gave me this power, but I need it again today, and I need it again today, and I need it again today, and I need it again tomorrow, and I need this power constantly in my life. I need it. We need this power in our life. Let me end with a simple story. Again, I shared this story last time, but I think it really uh, drives the point home. There's a story, and I'd encourage you, if you have not read this book, to go pick up this book on Amazon or wherever you get your books from. It's, the book is called Demystifying the Baptism in the Holy Spirit. It's a book by the name of a guy uh, named Jack Hayford. Jack, Jack tells of his story, uh, the story of he was, he's a, he's a, 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 a traveling uh, businessman, essentially. He gets on a plane. He's traveling to, I don't know if you remember where they were traveling to. He gets on a plane and he sits next to a businessman on the plane. And the guy, they start striking up a conversation, just talking, shooting the breeze, the whole thing, right? And Jack recognizes the dialect from this particular guy. He says, ah, oh, that's a very interesting accent that you have there. And the guy was really reluctant. He's almost like, you know, oh, I'm so sorry. He was very apologetic about his accent because he grew up in Oklahoma, but then he moved to the uh, American Southwest. And so he had these two different, uh, he had like an Indian dialect, but he also had like a Southern drawl. And so when Jack mentioned his dialect or his, 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 uh, his accent, the guy was like, oh, I'm so sorry. I apologize. No, 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 don't, don't apologize. I love your, I love the flavor of your accent and the whole thing. And Jack, he tells in this book, he tells of this moment. He's sitting on the plane talking to this guy, and he felt so strongly. Like, you know when God speaks, right? You know that moment. You're like, okay, God, that was you. But I don't like what you just said. This was Jack in that moment. Jack receives so clearly this, this, <laughs> this word from the Lord. Jack, I want you to speak to this man in tongues. I want you to speak to this man in your heavenly language. Now, Jack, <laughs> getting this word from the Lord, he has an option. Now. He, he's got a decision he's got to make. Like, do I go out and start speaking in my heavenly language to this guy and like per perhaps like shut down the conversation altogether? Maybe he thinks I'm cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. Maybe he thinks like, oh, I want to change my seat. This whole, this whole thing. And Jack... 
He decides he's not going to do it. He moves on with the conversation. He tries to tell him about Jesus, shuts the conversation down, tries to give him a Bible, shuts the conversation down, the whole thing. And Jack now has got a problem. Jack's got a problem because he had a direct mandate from God. I want you to speak to this man in your heavenly language. And Jack, now, he's just sitting here stewing. He's sitting here praying on the plane. And he says, God, I, I, listen, forgive me. I, have, I, I went against what you said. And I want you to give me another opportunity to, to talk to this guy. And so he's, thinking, he's like racking his brain trying to figure out a way he can actually come and, and like obey the command of God. He's trying to think of this way. And he felt like God dropped a creative idea in his heart. And he says... He turns to the gentleman and he says, listen, I know you're from Oklahoma and I know you have a, uh, uh, a dialect in, in Native American. I know you, you, like you're from the Southwest and you have this dialect that you speak in frequently. He says, and, and Jack says this, this is only God. He says, I felt like um, God gave me the, this, this creative idea. He says, listen, when I was a kid, he turns to the gentleman, when I was a kid, I, I learned this phrase. In, uh, in a different language, and I don't know what it means, and I don't know what it, I don't I have any idea what it means. And Jack says, do you mind if I share it with you? And the man says, yeah, sure, go ahead. So Jack, he starts to speak in his heavenly language. He starts to speak in tongues, um, as the Bible says. And the man, the man, the businessman sitting next to him begins to tear up. He begins to water up and he says, yeah, I, I know that. I know that dialect all, all too well. He says, I don't know exactly what you're saying, but I do know you're talking about a light that came down from the sky and that changed the world. That's, what, that's the idea of what you're talking about. Jack goes on to lead this guy to the Lord. Jack goes on to lead him to the search prayer and he gives his life to Jesus. Can I tell you this today? What we're talking about is not natural. What we're talking about is supernatural. And I understand to wrap our natural minds around this idea of the supernatural sometimes seems impossible. But this is the God that we serve. He is a supernatural, miracle-working God who has more for you, who has a power available for you today. And you may not understand it. You may have questions about it. You may disagree with it. But as a, as a believer in Jesus Christ, my, my challenge to you today is this. Are you open enough to the power of God. Are you open enough to what God wants to do in your life that he may very well so fill you with the heavenly language that you're like, I didn't believe in it. I didn't agree with it, the whole thing, but God, God, God may have to get you while you're sleeping, right? Because you've got so many conscious objections. God's got to have his way with you while you sleep and you wake up and you're praising God in another language. This may very well be the case because there is more for you. There is more for me. There is a power available for you no matter what your objection is, no matter what your questions are, no matter what your background is I want to be faithful to the word of God that there is more for you don't stop at a certain level don't stop when you receive a heavenly language don't even stop and go keep going because there's more power for you you will know you were filled with the power of the Holy Spirit so full so full that you find yourself sharing Jesus in places you would never share Jesus before you find yourself sharing people with or sharing with people you'd never talked to before you find yourself performing signs and wonders not because you're doing them but because the power of God is so on you that you can lay hands on people and they become healed. You can lay hands on people and they are delivered from disease. You can see uh, the marriages come to rest. Or you can see powerful, miraculous things happen. Yeah. And there's more for you. There's more for us. There's more for this church. Amen.